sit down. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Epiphany. The Greek word means revelation or radiant appearing. Epiphany begins with Jesus' baptism and it ends today with his transfiguration, which is the high point. It's where the veil is completely pulled back. Let us pray. These are your words, Holy Father. Sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You can be seated. Jesus and three of his disciples leave the others and they go up on a high mountain. A mountain which, interestingly enough, is not named. When I was in Israel a number of years ago, it's quite fascinating what the Roman Catholics have done, and this dates back a long time ago, in that the Roman Catholics have built churches on all of these sites. When you read your Bible, you know, it could be the Sermon on the Mount, it could be, uh, it could be the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, uh, it could be any kind of event in which Jesus was doing something, and the Roman Catholics have built a church right there. Even when they healed Peter's mother-in-law, do you realize they built a church over top of the, of the remains of this house that was considered to be Peter's mother-in-law? It's a, got a glass bottom. And when you're in the church, you can look down on the, on the floor through the glass and see the remains. Those are all my Catholics, boy, I'm telling you what. But when it comes to the transfiguration, the mountain is not named. So you go up on this mountain, and there is the Church of the Transfiguration on top of that mountain. And you go on this mountain over here, and there's the Church of the Transfiguration over there. And you go up on the top of this mountain over here, and there's the Church of the Transfiguration over there. The Roman Catholics just wanted to make sure that they got their bases covered. Because the mountain is not named. But Peter, James, and John, and Jesus, they go on top of this unnamed mountain, at least to us. They go there for evening prayer. Because evening prayer was a standard operating procedure for all devout Jews. There Jesus pours out his soul in high communion with God the Father. The other, the others, though, having finished their nightly devotions, they wrap themselves up and they lay down to go to sleep. And Jesus, still in prayer, just like later on in Gethsemane, is thinking of the prolonged agony that he is about to endure. The reason I say that is because he speaks about it nine verses prior to this and eleven verses later. He thinks of the pain and he thinks of the shame of having to go to Jerusalem, of having to die at the hands of godless men as their enemy. He is going to be considered as a blasphemer, and he is actually going to be judged as a sorcerer. He is going to be found guilty of being in league with the devil. One who is in league with the devil to do his mighty miracles. He's thinking about how he is the Passover lamb slain so that the destroyer will pass over those covered in his blood. And then, all of the sudden, he is changed. He radiates this effulgent light as his divinity shines through his humanity, his flesh. His clothing that he is wearing doesn't even keep it contained. Jesus is transfigured with face and clothes emanating as majestic as the sun itself. Now, I posit to you, and I could be wrong about this, but I'm not. I posit that that is exactly how Adam and Eve were before the fall. I know in all of our children's books that we have, you just have Adam and Eve looking no different from you and I, with the exception of clothes. I liken them to shine like the sun itself. 
They were just like what Jesus is doing with their bodies emanating the exact same light in the exact same way for they are made in the image of God. And one of the characteristics of God is that he is what? He's light. And they are too. But as you know, as soon as our first parents fell into sin, the light begins to fade. No different than that risistat that you've got at your house where you slowly begin to fade the light. And it fades fast. What does the Bible even say? It says they knew that they were naked. <laughs> they were naked before. Adam and Eve realized their nakedness after the light or after the glory of God fades away. Regardless, here the divine son allows the fullness of God's glory, glory that he had with his father before time began, to shine forth from his human nature. Or put it another way, he goes native. This is who he really is. He is true man. He is true humanity. The disciples, of course, wake from their grogginess by all the splendor. Probably thought it was the sun shining that they'd slept all night long. They gaze awestruck at the wonder taking place before them, having to what? Shield their eyes from what they see. I wonder if it's at this time or later that the disciples thought about Psalm 93, which begins, The Lord reigns and He is robed in majesty. Or Psalm 104, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering Yourself with light as a garment. Well, when it couldn't get any more phenomenal, two human forms appear at Jesus' side, both in glory like that of angels. One is Elijah, who is the quintessential miracle-working prophet of the Old Testament, along with, as you know, Moses, the chief giver of the law. Now, these men have been long gone for hundreds and hundreds of years. But here they are. Having passed through the valley of the shadow of death and now experience the triumph that lay beyond mortality for the faithful servants of God. One of the things that I enjoy about this text is how Peter recognizes these two immediately. Folks, there weren't pictures of Elijah. There weren't pictures of Moses, nor were they wearing name tags. Hello, my name is. Peter recognizes them immediately. This indicates to me that in the kingdom to come, it's not that we won't know each other, but we will. Think of that immediately. We won't do it as we do now when we see somebody that we're like, oh, you were married to my sister's uncle's aunt and had, you know, like, you know, we try to figure out the family tree. No, you'll know the family tree. It's amazing. And I just come up with this. St. Paul says, we shall know fully as we have been known. My point is, this is just a glimpse, just for a brief moment, this is a glimpse of what the new heavens and the new earth will be like. Now only Luke tells us what they discuss, which is Jesus' upcoming exodus. Pretty incredible seeing how Moses has an exodus out of Egypt and Elijah had an exodus out of this age by a fiery chariot. Jesus, too, will have an exodus. And, of course, it's his suffering 
and his death that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. For on that scandalous cross was going to be the glorious fulfillment of everything that Elijah prophesied and everything that Moses' own exodus foreshadowed. As you can imagine, the disciples are lost in wonder. I mean, this is one of the most spiritual, significant spiritual events in all of recorded history. And they don't want it to end. Yet Moses and Elijah are completing what they are sent to do, and they are about to return, let's just say, to heaven, to Abraham's bosom, to paradise. But couldn't they be talked into staying just a little while longer? Wait! I mean, this is really good. Don't go! And then Peter blurts out that he wants to build three booths, three tents for the glory to dwell in and stay in as long as possible. What's Peter doing? He has forgotten at this moment who his Lord truly is, and he has put Christ on par with Moses and Elijah, making them all equals. But God the Father will fix that fast enough. I believe that Peter, I see it in my mind's eye, not that it makes it right, but I see Peter still mumbling, still trying to figure out where we're going to build the booths. We can sell tickets at the bottom of the mountain. It'll be great. It's like he's still elucidating his plans when there is an interruption. And a cloud appears. Often, wherever God the Father is, there is always this mention of a cloud. And here, this bright cloud descends from the clear sky, enveloping Jesus, the two heavenly visitors, and these three witnesses. And it's even more glorious. And then a voice from the midst of the cloud says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Followed by this gentle rebuke, listen to Him. This is not unlike what we heard Mary tell the attendants at the wedding just last week. Do whatever he says. God the Father says, listen to him. What the disciples are told here takes us back to this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, where Moses, I've told you before, is told of a prophet, capital P, whom God would raise up like Moses from your brethren, yet he is greater than Moses. And how they would have to listen to his words or lose the hope of salvation. In these last days, Jesus has spoken to us by his Son. It's why Jesus would so often say, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus gets the last word. The last day's word. Well, enveloped within this cloud and upon hearing the voice, the three disciples are scared to death. They are brought to their knees. And even their faces. In my neck of the woods, we say they were chewing carpet. Which is how it is with sinful people in the presence of God. Moreover, the unmediated voice of God is just sheer terror to unglorified human ears. Which is why God comes to us through what? Through means. He works humbly in, with, and under words and water and bread and wine through the words on a page and through the voice of a fellow sinner. Forgiving you of your sins. For this is how we must be dealt with for now. For now. Yet the gentle, patient response of our Lord cannot be overstated. He comes to the disciples in their dread. He touches them and he says, rise, have no fear. Beloved, he speaks this to you as well. 
For with him there is freedom from all fear. With him there is forgiveness of all sins. With him there is the, the, the deliverance from the devil. And with him there is the rising from the dead. Speaking of death, this glory that Jesus is enveloped in without a doubt is a testimony to who he is, but to it is something that you will share as well. In the ancient transfiguration hymn that the church sings, churches, Lutheran churches, Anglican churches all over the world are singing that exact same hymn that we just sang. O vision fair of glory, O wondrous type, O vision fair of glory that the church may share upon the mountain shows way brighter than the sun he glows. Daniel chapter 12 teaches that those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. Shine as in your body just like Adam and Eve did before the fall. Beloved, that's where you're headed. With heaven and earth full of his glory. Well, upon looking around the cloud, Moses and Elijah, they're all gone. And all the disciples see now is Jesus. With the stars above them and the silent hills around them, the divine glory has faded from Jesus' countenance and his robe. Well, it's like it was before. So in the meantime, before we take on the same radiance, before our bodies, our glorified bodies, before they emanate the same brightness in this world that is to come as true humanity, what do we do? Friends, God is in His holy temple and He summons all the earth to hush to be silent before Him. And why is that? So that we may hear His Son when He speaks. And in hearing His words, we rise and we are not afraid. In the bright and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for the office.